Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, it's such a shame this can't be a live event at the APGRD, but the brilliant thing about it being um, able to go out uh, on the internet instead is that people can watch from all over the world. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today, I am speaking to Inwa Ellens, award-winning writer, poet, playwright, performer, um, and an extraordinary uh, promoter, hoster, MC, um, and supporter of other people's work, one of the most uh, extraordinarily generous artists we have working in poetry and in theatre. Um, Inwa was born in Nigeria and came to England via Dublin as a teenager. His uh, struggles with the Home Office were chronicled in, uh, with incredible humour and grace in his show, An Evening with an Immigrant. Um, his first move from poetry to theatre was with his show, The 14th Tale. It was a one-man show and I had the privilege of seeing it in a tiny theatre in South London before it took the UK by storm and it ended up at the National Theatre. Re a real word of mouth phenomenon where people just needed to tell everyone after they'd seen it how extraordinary it was and it uh, caught a huge, uh, huge wave. Um, since then, it was made two shows for the National Theatre, produced by the National Theatre in conjunction with Fuel, uh, Barbershop Chronicles, which has toured around the world uh, and around the UK, and most recently, Three Sisters, his version of the Chekhov set in Nigeria. But principally today, we're going to talk about Half God of Rainfall, which premiered as a play at the Kiln Theatre in 2019, while simultaneously being published as a book with the form of an epic poem. We're gonna to come to talking about form later. It synchronizes the Greek gods and the Yoruba gods and sees revenge taken on Zeus for his abuse of multiple women. And it's an absolute groundbreaking reception of uh, classical mythology. So thank you, Inra, for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. Um, let's start with the character right at the center of this story, whose um, uh, name, uh, Demi, says it all. He's a half god um, and a basketball player. And um, the mythologizing of sports stars in the play is phenomenal. And some of the descriptions of moments in basketball games are like the best of descriptions from Homer of moments in battle. So was that a way in? Yeah, abs abs absolutely. Um, I remember reading Christopher Logue's um, war series where he rewrites some of those epic battles. And I was hypnotized by his use of language and also the use of language in, in basketball. I still play basketball. You can see my two basketballs up there. So on the court, we play and then we do the same thing of retelling what, what has just happened to us um, or just, what we, we have just done to each other. And in the retelling, we exaggerate. Things become larger and more specific and more precise. So marrying those two languages, those two attempts to to create urban legends out of the immediate and then merge that with the Greek legendary stuff um, began to, I don't know, tickle my head years back, maybe 10 years ago, and I was looking for something to synthesize, to bring them together. And Half Foot of Rainfall just gave me um, space to do so. Am I right in thinking that the first time you'd played with a, a basketball uh, player who was a sort of Promethean prototype was in Candy Coated Unicorns and yeah. Combat? stars that there's there's a there's a poem which does that was that the sort of seed of that yeah the poem that does that is called a um, portrait of prometheus as a basketball player um and that was the first thing that i'd created which fully rolled rolled um has the full gamut but even before that poem was written in 2011 around right 2009 was when i began to have the idea of, of a basketball player who is also the god, I'm um, sorry, the descendant of a god, um, and Prometheus was just a short way to experiment and to see, and then Half God of Rainfall came a few years later that, after that. Yeah. Where does the title come from? Um, so around 2009 or so, I wrote a long poem called Of All the Boys of Plateau Private School about boys that I went to school with in Nigeria. Plateau Private. And in that school, there were a bunch of weirdos that I hung around with. I always hung, hung around with, with like the, yeah, the nerds. And one of them was a guy called T. And T had this really disgusting habit where he could spit as high as he could. He would spit as high as he could into the air, then catch his own saliva in his mouth. It was this really gruesome party trick. But in this poem, I described him as the half god of rainfall. 
and um and i was reading this poem with um with a poet and a tutor of mine who sadly passed away last year called ruddy lumsden and ruddy underlined that image he said you know this is a great great line in the poem the half got a rainbow i can see it and i said what's so good about it you just said it just captures so much and there's this urban mythology you're bringing to this guy who has this dirty party trick and i began to meditate on it and suddenly um a basketball player who could do everything that i couldn't came out of meeting of that of that title and in digging into him and trying to build him up as a character um the story was born and um as you built up his legend um in your in your retelling of the story um he becomes uh the child of a, of a rape by zeus of um uh of a priestess in the African uh, uh, pantheon of, of gods. When, at what point in that sort of um, journey did you decide that this play was going to syncretize the two two pantheons? I suppose the Greek gods and the Yoruba um, gods. Maybe I was two or three drafts into it, or into just the building of the story, when I began to dig into into. Well, a couple of things happened. The, the initial thing is that when I was writing the story, I decided I wanted to create a demigod. I went to the god that I knew. And because I'd grown up here and, you know, been educated here in the West, I instantly went to Zeus. And then I began to dig into him as a father figure and discovered all of his horrific crimes. And I was faced with having to make a difficult decision to either write the story about Demi and just ignore the Zeus stuff or try and write the Zeus stuff. And I chose to do both, just try and tell the same story, but, but imbibe it with all of the horrific things that I discovered. And in doing so, I began to question myself. One, why did I go to Zeus? Why did I go to any of the African, the, the Yoruba gods and goddesses. And I realized they didn't because I'd never been taught about them in school. And this is because um, education in Nigeria was left over by colonization. So they, they taught us about Zeus, but sort of swept our traditional beliefs away. Um, and in doing so, I thought, how can I re rebalance this? And I thought I just have to bring the pantheon and when I decided to make the, 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 the Orishas as present as the Olympians, I thought, okay, there must be other pantheons of belief. And I know about the Ramayana, the Indian myths. And I began to dip into, you know, ones from, um, you know, China, from New Zealand, and discovered just how many other thunder gods existed in all of these cultures. And, and yeah, and I think that was it. So maybe in the third or fourth draft was when I realized, okay, I need to bring I need to bring this together. I need to rebalance that. You've hit on so many important, I suppose, questions for, for classicists at the moment, which is how do we uh, deal with um, a mythology um, and a whole uh, body of literature where where you know uh, gods just rape women all over the place or often euphemistically and metaphorically mm. um uh they're allowed to be turned into animal you know they're depersonalized but it but it's incredibly tricky based uh, if you're teaching this material or you're telling the story of myths to small children how do you um on the one hand uh, share the love of you know Greek mythology and stories but on the other hand not gloss over so much of mm. the uh, inherent you know, patriarchy and misogyny in it and I think um one of the things that was so exciting about Half God of Rainfall was how um uh how directly you you addressed that. I was reading uh last night um, um one of the it had fantastic reviews and one of the FT reviews which said it's a playful nimble piece but it, it's hard to serious and far-reaching points about masculinity, power structures, colonialism and the way narratives and myth making can maintain a biased system and it it felt absolutely like in the play you were um, uh, refusing to look away from uh, the fact that all of those stories contribute to sustaining certain systems and certain educational systems. And um, I'm really interested that you mentioned about, about education and uh, the sort of colonial imposition of teaching these um, stories, particularly um, in you know, colonial education systems where um, Derek Walcott spoke a lot about, you know, the fact that most of his uh, 
uh, your classmates could quote Wordsworth, but not any local mm. literature. So I was really interested. At what point in the story, or, or in your creation of the story, did you realize that um, you were going to have to take Zeus down? <laughs> um, this was later on, maybe draft six or seven. And, um, and it came about because it came about after, after I decided um, what Demi's fate would be. And that is because of conversations I suddenly started having with lots of my, of my female friends. Um, one of them who I shared early draft of the, of the play, when I sent it to her, she didn't respond. And I thought, oh my God, maybe I've triggered something um, that is incredibly callous of me. And, I, and maybe after three or four days, I sent a message saying, are, are you okay? If you didn't like the book, that's fine. You don't have to like it. But also if I've triggered something, I really apologize for that. And she, she responded very quickly saying, no, she really loved and appreciated the book. But it reminded her of, of an incident where um, an ex-lover of hers had sexually abused her, had, had, had raped her in a boat. And the boat was named after the god of darkness. So when she was reading it, it was it wasn't it, and it was it was cathartic to her having elements of that story sort of explained in a narrative, um, and and when I began to speak to my sisters and lots of my female friends, some of them had been survivors as well, I realized that um, one Demi as the savior of the story didn't work because men create systems in which they protect men. Um, Therefore, having a man do so didn't reflect the real world. So I needed to remove him from the story, which meant that Modupe had to take center stage. And it was always going to be a story of, about Modupe. And when I decided that, the question became, how do you end this? How do you kill a god? And a couple of things um, were spinning through my head. It was The first is, what would be the repercussions to Modupe's mental health for taking a life? And I didn't want her to just callously kill someone, even out of vengeance, however justified it is, would I want, because that continues the trauma. And I, and I was very nervous. I was very careful of that. And, and the answer to that question required me to do even more research and meditations on what Zeus was as a figure. And um, another friend of mine who had tracked down and forgived her abuser explained that the reason she was able to forgive him is because when she met with him and spoke with him, she saw that he carried the weight of his crime on his shoulders. She saw him constantly questioning everything. What made me think this was okay? Um, what, what, what is the legacy of power, stru power structures that have been handed down by various men to me to legitimize that? And he kept on questioning that. So, when, so I sort of asked those questions of Zeus, would Zeus ever do so? And the answer was no, because he just remained himself. And that for me gave, um, yeah, gave me, um, I guess, the strength as a writer and as a friend of Modupe, as a character that I create, to, to carry her through this journey. Um, and then I decided, yeah, she, ha she has to kill him. But even so, she does so by looking at the women around her in that moment. She looks at Hera, she looks at the Furies, she looks at Helen of Troy, and they sort of give her the go-ahead that it's okay to do this. But even then, I was trying to think about the agency of her as a Black woman surrounded by all these powerful women who had legitimized Zeus's actions. And all of that thought, okay, this she needs to do this, one for herself, but also for them because none of them had come this close to ending that. So all of those things um, gave me um, the impetus. And finally, the only way to kill a god was to kill him twice, <laughs> which is what we do in the book. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's such an extraordinary and unexpected ending because um, uh, to, to, and so I found it so powerful that the, the play took the decision that, you know, enough, enough, enough. Um, actually, uh, this group of women will take vengeance on this figure. And there's a beautiful glimpse in the very end of the script of a sort of post-patriarchal <laughs> world. So there's a, um, I picked up a quote, the mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, uh, the mothers and daughters, fathers and sons shared rough stories of their attacks. The guilty who were free woke up to crowds shouting, enough, enough, 
mm. enough. And it felt like absolutely a, a play of its moment that in the in the in this retelling or this reclaiming of those uh, the stories that you absolutely captured the sort of mood of the moment, which was enough, enough, enough. But that little beautiful tentative glimpse of what a post patriarchal world could look like mm. if that structures are taken away was um, was absolutely breathtaking um, in the theater to, to watch and uh, an incredibly moving, I think, for everybody who, who witnessed it. Um, as that, as it developed as a, as a piece and, and in some ways um, the, the Greek gods came to represent the sort of patriarchy and the Yoruba gods came to represent the, the matriarchy. How was that, did that dichotomize in your head? I mean, was that a sort of, um, uh, and there's obviously a bigger allegory there about colonialism, but I, it felt like as the play developed that became quite a stark divide between a patriarchal and a matriarchal system. Well, um, I won't necessarily class the Orishas and the Europa gods as descendants of a matriarchal system mm -hmm. because it's still incredibly patriarchal. Um, the godfathers is Ele Dumare and he's a man. And then there's Arumila who's the seer mm -hmm. and there's the sh Shango. I think um, a lot of the matriarchal sentiments comes through Shango as a male figure who is in service to Oshun. Now, a couple of things um, made that possible. Um, one is that Sh Shango in, in his mythology was a mortal man. He was, he was a king who when he died, his, um, he was a king who cracked the power of electricity and harnessed the power of thunder. So when he died, he was deified and becomes a god. So because of his close relationship with humanity, he isn't as egotistical as the other, as the other um, um, male gods in the pantheon of the Orisha. So this is why he is um, sexually um, stimulated by Modupe as a mortal because it's close to mortality, but also why he can absolutely humble himself before Oshun, who is a goddess and she's always been a goddess. She was born into that. But also Shango embodies um, um, a masculine energy um, and he, he recognizes his own inherent toxicity because at the very start of the story, he's warned, hold your anger, don't do anything, but he does so. And this is what kicks Zeus into action. So there's something more about cause and effect, time and the repercussions that is embodied through Shango's story lineage through it. But also in understanding that, he understands what Oshun was trying to do and humbles himself before the matriarchal um, powers that surround him. Um, but, but having said all of that, within Orisha and Ifa as a religion, as a culture, um, there isn't the binaries um, in terms of gender don't exist as they do among the Greek pantheon or in the West really. So they don't really pay close attention to them or they don't really, the gods don't necessarily adhere to them. Um, and it's to do with just even how prayers are made in Ifa, how consultations happen with the gods. Everything is a lot more cloaked and, and nuanced and fluid, fluid than that. Um, but there's, a matri there's definitely a matrilineal, matrilineal power structure that, in, that, that engulfed your, the Orishas in the story, but Ifa as itself isn't necessarily so. It's, it's more, much more fluid than that. When the, um, you were engaging with all that um, material, um, how are you thinking about form? Because I think it's really interesting that um, uh, on the page, it looks quite like uh, an epic poem and you've consciously divided it into books, with, which feels like a sort of nod to, to Homer or the sort of um, epic poem. And I've experienced it actually. I've also listened to the book on Audible, which is you reading really? and that that feels like the epic storyteller because it's it's you reading the text um and it feels like there's so many interesting influences in that but that but that perhaps there's a hybridity of of forms going on between oral poetry and theater as well as a sort of hybridity of cultures yeah there's there's so much hybridity happening <laughs> 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 this is why sometimes I think I may have done too much with the story. Um, so I think Dante wrote the Inferno in the Terza Rima. So 
I was trying to speak to a European epic poetic lineage in trying to write in the Tertiarima. But a couple of things happened in the very first draft, which is that I realized that um, it began taxing, it became taxing to the ear because the audience, and even I was, as I was reading out to like, you know, test audiences began listening out for the rhyme. And the rhyme came at the hard end of the sentence, which would sometimes conclude a thought. And therefore I realized that this isn't working. It's, 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 it becomes tiring for the audience. Um, so I decided to do a couple of things. One is that I gave myself the freedom to let the rhyme or the, the end of a line or the sense, the, the sense of the end of a line run on to use enjambment as, as much as possible right through the form. Secondly, um, because of the types of Englishes that I speak and that the character speaks, so it isn't um, standard British English, it isn't a Queen's English, it is a Nigerian English. And because of the cultural backgrounds of all those characters, that all of that is tinged with American English. Um, and a lot of that stems from hip hop. I wanted to widen the line. So I, I increased it from a terzariza into a hexametrical terzarima, which, um, which um, holds, um, I think, um, 12 syllables rather than um, 10. Um, so that gave me more space to play with language, to play with, with internal rhyme schemes, all of which I took from listening to way too much hip hop as a kid. Um, and finally, um, I wanted to, to speak to orality, which is the West African tradition of storytellers who travel from village to village telling the story. So, so being able to use lots of internal rhyme schemes, being able to play with the length of a line to slow down and speed up things, um, um, allowed space for the oral voice to be heard in on the page. And I was, I was just consciously aware of all of that as forms, as, as histories, as legacies of language, of the written word and the spoken word that I could borrow from in order to, um, to tell this story that sat on all of those worlds that echoed so many of those traditions. It's so exciting what you've done there because the, um, uh, the hexameter takes us right back to, to the Homeric, which, mm. that slightly longer line that's longer than the sort of English obsession with the you know, Shakespearean pentameter and just gives us so much more, yeah. more space. And that incredible sort of terzarima that just keeps rolling forward. I, I guess, because we're always slightly expecting the fourth line, but actually the fourth line is the begin always the beginning of the next thing. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, I, I had the privilege of interviewing the late Derek Walcott about Omaros um, and its, oh, wow. its form and its, ter its terzarima form. And, um, and we kept coming back to the idea that it's just about the lapping of the, it felt like the lapping of the sea, that, that, yeah. that continual sort of um, way forward. But it feels like um, the half quarter of rainfall plays a really important part in this uh, attempt to find a way in in English to find a to find an epic storytelling telling form. And and that um, your combination of a sort of flowing in John's <laughs> Tetsurima with that longer line feels incredibly powerful in terms of the way it allows you to to pull in a sort of um, range of discourses from the sort of um, straight English to the American, it, it all flows through the, the text and yet there's a lyricism that feels mm. highly, highly poetic. Um, and when we look at it on the page, it, it looks like an epic poem, but yet I think I was, when I watched it on stage, I wasn't particularly aware, I think, of its, of the fact that on the page it looked uh, like, um, like an epic poem, it, because it was performed by two actors on stage, it felt highly dramatic in terms of the balance of, of voices. And it wasn't until I really analyzed the experience afterwards that I thought, oh yeah, that was all third person narrative as yeah. opposed to, you know, first person theatrical dialogue. Was that, did you always have in your mind that as a play, it would be played out by two actors um, and have a kind of visual and physical life or, or was that something that emerged in the production process? Um, when I first started writing it, I thought I would just tell the story. It would be myself on stage. But in one of the, um, the R&D sessions, maybe in the penultimate draft, um, I was asked to experiment with another performer. Um, a really brilliant woman came, read a, a few of the scenes and embodied the character so beautifully. And I saw what was possible in me 
describing something and her body or just how she stood on stage, how she turned, somehow and underlining and lifting the sense of those lines. And I thought, okay, there's de we definitely need another actor here who can do all of that, a powerful female um, actor to embody so much. And when I decided to make that decision, I realized in that case, we should probably get a powerful, brilliant male actor to embody all of those things. So, and I'm not an actor, so I just kind of pulled myself away from the storytelling. And that's when it really came to life, finding actors who could embody so much, who can transcend and play all of those characters through the text and, and be, be third person orators, but also have um, opinions on what it is they're saying, which means they, de they deliver the lines in specific ways that haven't done that, slip into those characters they just made opinions about. It required extremely precise and lithe and nimble work. And those actors did such an amazing job given how dense and complex the text is at the same time they were able to make it feel light and funny and add so much color. It, yeah, it was yeah, it was incredible. They did such an amazing um, job staging this text. Yeah. And in terms of its sort of legacy in your work, I mean, you've always been engaging with myth and you've always engaged with those ideas. And there's always been a balance in your work between epic poetry and storytelling and like the 14th tale and now you're writing um uh drama in what we might call a more conventional way you know uh, barbershop mm. chronicles or, or three sisters um but how do those two things the sort of um epic poem and its baggage and and the dramatic continue clashing in your work because it, it feels like you're sitting in this incredibly exciting liminal position and, and almost bringing the poet back into the theater it feels like we're starting as a culture again to find out what you know poetic theater might, might be look. having been quite scared of it you know for a long time our, the, the british sort of focus on on naturalism and and prose in theater seems like it's sort of lifting and the poets are coming back into the theater mm. space but how do those things sort of forge for you going forwards um i think because i began as a poet and solely as a poet and creating text that I could perform, it meant that as long as I could get the audience to be invested in myself as a storyteller and my stories, uh, then I could take them anywhere, which meant that I never thought about scale and never I thought about the cost of mounting the stories I was telling because it was just me and my voice on stage, which meant that I allowed my imagination to run wild, which is why the Half God of Rainfall came into being. Um, and, it, and it means that I'm invested in telling massive stories because I still think I can I can do it economically. <laughs> you know, I could, you know, so I think that limitlessness of my imagination means that I'm still constantly pushing, how can I tell the biggest story but from the smallest point of view? What, what, what does that look like? Um, now that I'm luckily enough to be in a big position where I can tell big stories and I can have big budgets behind them, um, I have the inverse um, um, problem, which is that how to stay small, how to stay specific. And, and that is, and, and those are, that's the game that I play with myself. How can I tell big, epic, epic stories, but focus the lens in and, and center it on, on, on a voice or, or, or an untrustworthy storyteller or someone who um, tangentially doesn't feel important to the big things, but at the same time becomes absolutely central to it. How do I find unusual ways to the heart of the matter? How do I find the atom in the center of the bomb and make that the most specific, the most important thing? Those are, that's how the tension stays with me, with, with me as a creator right now. Um, I have to write a novel um, for HarperCollins and this is the question I'm asking. What story do I tell now? How big it is and what is my way in? Who's the small character? Um, and I'm, I'm trying not to rush it. Um, I'm, just, I'm just taking my time. And um, perhaps uh, finally, then we come to the question is, as we come out of this really strange year mm -hmm. <laughs> and there are stories to be told. Um, one of the things that's been really interesting about, 
I suppose about your work in the last couple of years is some of your writing has has reached right back to to um, ancient cultures and mythologies to find a way into telling very modern stories about the world we live in. And some of your work, um, uh, I think of your um, recent uh, uh, poetry collection of fuck poems, um, uh, is absolutely engaged in the contemporary and the and the political um, and in terms of writing about the world now, as we come out of this strange year, um, do you feel you'll be reaching back for stories from, from our, our sort of history to as a way into writing, or do you think you'll be absolutely in the now and the contemporary? Um, the next play that I'm writing, I have to start digging into the first draft in the next couple of um, months or so, is about the, um, the last days of struggle against colonization in northern Nigeria. So it's set around um, 18, starts around 1865 and ends around 1903, 1904. So I'm going really back <laughs> at the moment. And I'm trying to use that to discuss um, what, um, what Nigeria could have been, how Islam as a fourth exists as a force of, of politics of religion, of culture, of agriculture, of clothing, of matrilineal lineal power structures, how it existed before um, um, a British invasion and how all of that was messed up by capitalism and power and, and gunpowder, you know? So I'm hoping to do that to explain the legacy of, of empire but outside of the empire, not here where we look at it through rose tinted glasses and misunderstand you know, what actually happened and the effects of that. So, and, and I hope in doing so, we can you know, understand why we've been lied to consistently um, by the powers that be here, you know, the successive governments and what, what damage we do to ourselves as, as, as a nation um, as a cultural heritage bubble by constantly lying to ourselves and building on lies rather than looking at truth. Um, so, that's, so that's what I'm trying to do. So in order to explain here, I'm even going further back. Um, with regards to writing about the pandemic, I don't know, I think we're still too close to this right now to understand the madness from the methodo methodo uh, methodology. I don't, yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't, I'm not going to be writing about this anytime soon, I don't think. In the actual, um, which is the, um, the collection of poems, the actual fuck, there's one poem called Fuck Batman, which is about the pandemic, but it's still through the lens of this um, mythological DC superhero character. And that's the closest I'm going to come to writing about the pandemic, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much for talking to me today about such an enormous uh, range of topics and, um, and subjects. It's been totally eye-opening for me and I hope that anyone, um, obviously the production at the kiln is not uh, still on, but if you, uh, but obviously the, the book text um, of the Half God of Rainfall is, is very much um, uh, still available and such a fascinating um, uh, clash of uh, cultures and such an important book in terms of um, uh, our moments now uh, in history that I'd thoroughly encourage you to uh, to explore it. Um, I'd like to end, if I may, rather cheekily by asking if you would read uh, the poem that um, opens uh, Half God of uh, Rainfall. I think it's such a uh, striking way into the book. Would that be okay? Yeah, that's perfect. I will. Um, <laughs> Here it is, um, Portrait of Prometheus as a Basketball Player. His layup will start from mountains, not with landslides, rumble, or gorgon clash of titans, but as shadow fall across stream, some thief in a night, black Christ type stealth. In the nights before this, his name, whispered in small circles, muttered by demigods and goddesses, spread rebellious rough on the tongues of whores and queens, pillows pressed between thighs, moaning. Men will call him father, son, or king of the court. His stride will ripple oceans, feet whip crack quick, his back will scar hunched over, a silent storm about him. 
both hands scorched and bleeding. You see nothing but sparks splashed off his palms, nothing but breeze beneath his shook and jive towards the basket, carved of darkness, net of soil and stars. Fearing nothing of passing from legend to myth, he fakes left, cross over, dribbles down the line, and then soars, an eagle chained to hang time. <laughs>